And so if you kind of go back to the basics, like right now I'm doing it with boxes, right? So the, the boxes that I'm buying every week on Monday, I get a shipment of boxes. So I only buy the boxes I need to use for the next week and that's it. And then every Monday they ship me another set of boxes. And so you got to adjust your, you adjust your just in time to have a little longer lead time than what you used to. Without supplies, there's no surgery. Without products, there's no patient care. Welcome to Power Supply, the healthcare supply chain podcast focused on helping you navigate the intricacies of logistics, purchasing, contracting, and supplier relationships. Each episode, we speak with healthcare executives, supply chain leaders, and innovative entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the loading dock to strategic sourcing, from buyers to the C-suite and across the enterprise, we tackle the real-life issues impacting the healthcare supply chain. Whether you're tuning in for conversation or inspiration, we're glad you're here. You're just in time to hear it from the source and stock up on insight. So sit back and plug into Power Supply. This week on Power Supply, we speak with Wade Blum, Director of Operations and Supply Chain at Caresfield. And Hayes, we are going to be talking about just-in-time. We're going to be talking about supply chain disruption. And instead of telling everybody that just-in-time is dead and supply chain disruption killed it, we're going to be talking about the fact that maybe with a few adjustments, we can start to get things back in line, not only from the manufacturer side of the equation, but also for many of the healthcare supply chain leaders and and frontline folks that are listening to this show. Yes, and I'm going to ask him, so you better listen in. I'm going to ask him what that date is on mustard that says best used by. (laughs) And he's going to tell us because he has a history and a long history in the food service business. So come come in and listen to it. All right, we're going to be right back after a short break with Wade Blum. I'm Hayes Walder. This is Gary Skinner. And I'm Justin Poulin. A production of 17 Studios. You're listening to Power Supply. Joining us now is Wade Blum, Director of Operations and Supply Chain at Caresfield. And what I love about this episode is we're going to give some people out there in supply chain some reasons for optimism that maybe this disruption is not as bad as it seems. It just requires an adjustment in strategy. And in fact, despite many of the topics and conversations that we've had on this podcast before, Wade's going to talk a little bit about just in time and the fact that it is still possible. So I'm excited, Wade. So (laughs) thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, of course. Glad to be here. I'm glad to hear this because all I've heard is just in time is dead. So this is going to be fantastic to kind of, you know, hear the other side of this. This is going to be helpful. Yeah. And we all know people in supply chain need a reason for optimism right now. I mean, it's been a tough, grueling time, especially in, in healthcare supply chain. And Wade, I think we'll even just start there. Why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, your background in operations and supply chain? Because you know, very specifically, you came from a different industry before you entered healthcare. Yeah, I did. Most of my career I actually spent on in food. So a little bit the other side of the FDA scale, because you got medical on one side, you got food on the other. So I've spent almost my entire career in, in food with the exception of a, of a three-year stint at Toyota. But yeah, I, I recently made the, made the switch from the food side of the business to the medical side of the business. I'd be curious. Can I just hop in there? Wait, obviously that's a big difference. Obviously you're kind of doing the same thing. You have parish bowls and things like that. But when you walked into uh, healthcare, what was your first thoughts when you looked at our supply chain compared to, you know, some of the other things you've done? Uh, it's very different. It's uh, reminiscent of the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. the food supply chain 10 years ago. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of, I would say analytics and, and advantages and computers that have been put onto the food side of the business because your expiration 
dates are so condensed that you just don't have that on the medical side. And so there's a ton of opportunities. Now, what is similar between, you know, the food industry and healthcare? Like if you were to compare them side by side, where, where did you come into this role and kind of be like, oh yeah, this is exactly like what I've done. Yeah. So, I mean, with food and medical, right, they both go into the human body or they interact with the human body. So they're both controlled by very similar legislations. And so as a result, it's, it's, it is very similar in, in a lot of what you do and a lot of what you manufacture. It's just you're manufacturing things, you know, one is a device, where it, whereas the other is a consumable, you know, beans or mac and cheese or something like that. But they're, they're, they're very, very similar. And I think people would be amazed actually how similar they are. But there are a couple key differences, the biggest of which is probably, I would call it substitutions. You know, in the food industry, you can substitute relatively easily, right? If you're making a can of soup and you got, you know, I'm going to put chicken, peas, corn, and, and you know, <laughs> whatever you're going to put into it. Well, if, if you're heart struggling to get corn, you can change your mixture. So rather than it's 10% corn, you can downgrade it to 5% corn. That's not a, not a big deal. But if you're manufacturing a tourniquet, you know, and you're manufacturing a TPE one specifically, if you change your TPE formulation in any way, shape, or form, you are going to lose all the elasticity for that product and, and you just simply can't do it. What about, you know, in terms of inspections, like you talked about a lot of the FDA interaction is fairly similar, but does that mean inspections are the same too? To some, to some degree. So you have to, you're going to have your annuals, right? So you have an annual FDA if on the food side, you have an annual FDA and you have an annual USDA. And then on the medical side, you have a as needed FDA inspection. So you're going to get, you know, an as needed at least once a year if you're a manufacturer. And then on anything you, you import, there's a system that the FDA uses when you import and it has to have all the certain requirements and they flag random shipments and they have to sit you know, in your warehouse at your dock until the FDA comes and inspects them and clears them. So that kind of begs the, the expiration date piece too. How do the expiration dates, do they also work similarly between food and, and healthcare or is, or is that different? That is very different. So if you look at, you know, when you're manufacturing something on the food side, typically it's one year until it has to be in its finished good form is your expiration date. Obviously, if you're dealing with a raw meat or something of that nature, it's seven days. Whereas, you know, if you have TPE or you have a latex glove or if you have labels, you know, it's two, five, 10 years can be the expiration date on a lot of these things. So I think that's probably pretty exciting to you, right? And you saw <laughs> huge <laughs> it wasn't the seven day. <laughs> yeah, you're like, this is pretty good. Yeah, oh, I, yeah this. I like this. I look out at the inventory and I'm going, all right, you know, how am I going to turn this inventory? And I go, oh wait, I have two years to sell this. It doesn't matter yeah, that I have a little extra. A, <laughs> it's not in a freezer either. They go out and look at it. Yeah, so. exactly. It's not you know, it's not held between five degrees below zero and two degrees above. You know, I almost wonder like. So what's the interaction like between Salesforce and Ops as a result of the expiration dates? Because, you know, that shorter shelf life, I can see that causing a lot of strain in that food industry where, you know, there's always pressure on sales to keep selling, right? I get that. But a common dynamic in organizations is strife between sales and Ops because Ops wants sales to smooth out and be predictable, and then their customers aren't, and then sometimes a communication breaks down, and then on the other side, sales is like, I can't control how the customer wants what they want. All I can tell you is, I have this opportunity, and I need you to deliver on it. And then the company says, well, everybody wants this right now, so you and, and every other salesperson that's blowing up my phone that's taking up my time and preventing me from actually delivering this, because I got to explain to you why I can't give it to you right away, like... Is that a different, is that an even more accentuated dynamic in the food industry because of those expirations? It is and it isn't. So your big customers, you know, so your Walmarts, your Amazons, your Targets, right? They're going to lock in their forecast 12 weeks out and they rarely, if ever, change them, which is really beneficial. The problem is your smaller retailers, they don't lock in their targets and they, you know, they'll come in and they'll say, well, I'm going to buy you know, 20 pallets of product and they buy one or they come in and they cut a PO for 70 pallets. And you're like, oh my gosh, 
I don't know what I'm going to do with this now. So healthcare is kind of like having those smaller customers, but you don't have to deal with the fact that you've only got seven days of shelf life. So you have a little bit more inventory stability as a result of longer expirations. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Uh, all right, wait, I got, I got to jump in here because this is like off topic, but my <laughs> wife will throw away, she'll throw away a mustard that says it's it's expired. <laughs> Should I do that? How, how critical are, are the exp- expiration dates on our stuff? It depends. So there's two different, there's, <laughs> oh, there's no, and I'm serious. If you look at, if you look at your products, <laughs> one is going to, you know, some of them will say, here's an expiration date, like on your milk. I would stick to that milk expiration date. Don't push that one. <laughs> she won't come close to it. <laughs> no, typically you can go right up to that. Um, but a lot of your products say best buy. So if it says best buy, usually you can push that like two or three years beyond what that best, that best ooh, buy date ooh. is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Value right yep. here. I like yep. this. So, yeah, if it <laughs> so, says, hey, if it says expiration, still, throw it out. Still. So, Hayes, you can still drink that Coors Light that's sitting in the back closet. <laughs> that Zima from twenty twenty one. It's still good. Well, it's it's clarified. It's not. It won't harm you. But the reason it says Best Buy is because the taste deteriorates. So, oh, okay, it, it, you could see some flavor deterioration. That's where the Best Buy comes in. All right, I don't go on the Zima because it was already that way. <laughs> <laughs> listen everybody that's in our room right now listen to us they're like they're getting value right now this, this is big big dollars right here hey thank you so much boy that's worth i i think i can just leave I, i've got what i needed <laughs> All right, I'll try to steer us back to the value. But <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, I got a lot of value out of that part of our interview. Um, so let's talk about warehousing, logistics, and freight, right? Because that's an area where everybody seems to be experiencing supply chain disruption, especially if you're talking about overseas. And, you know, it, it's not just domestic, like even just trying to get it into the docks. Like this has been such a big conversation. So, you know, I realize that, you know, that part might be a little bit different, you know, in healthcare from food, but I want to transition really to what's happening in, in healthcare today. And how do you look at, especially the freight situation, how do you look at that and say, because this is an optimistic and already humorous podcast today, <laughs> this episode, how do you, how do you look at that and then say, okay, supply chain disruption isn't as bad as it seems. Can you put that into a positive context? Cause I feel like everybody I talk to says freight's killing them. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no denying that things are inbound from ports are taking longer. That is, there's, there's no way around that. But if you look from a, if you look at, yeah, you know, I always use the FedEx map. I think that's the perfect example. If you look, so FedEx public, you can put in your zip code and it'll say two day ground. It's going to take two days to get from your zip code to the zip code you're sending it to. The FedEx map pre COVID and the FedEx map now is almost identical. There's one or two little spots that it's different, but it went from a two day service to a three day service, right? And so for freight, once it's in the US, it's it's really not bad. It's 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 really not. You know, and people who are experiencing these issues are typically trying to use third party logistics. So they're trying to f- hire an owner operator, you know, out of California for doing whatever they're trying to do. And that's typically where you're seeing the issues is because there's issues moving in and out of pr- out of out of ports. But once it's cleared the ports and it's into a warehouse in the U.S., it's it's really not that bad. It's it's not it's not the way it was, and so I I hear it all the time from some of my colleagues. They're like, "Oh, I'm I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with this," and I'm like, "I don't understand it. I, you shouldn't be because that that the, the times are the same. The shipping times are the same. The costs have gone up. Don't get me wrong. What used to be fifteen hundred dollars to send it from Minnesota to California is now thirty one hundred, right? But if the trucks are there, well, that's good to know, Wade. So what you're saying domestically we're we're in pretty good yeah. shape but what about getting to port is that still the issue and i saw something that i think was at taiwan was having massive issues now right 
Yeah, so there are some issues coming out of Asia. If you're coming out of Asia and trying to come through, you know, Seattle or Long Beach, there are delays. But it's not, yeah, Still. it's not as bad as people as people say though. It's you know, once my product, because I'm I'm bringing containers in probably every week. You know, I, I have them moving through Long Beach and Seattle, and it's one to two weeks, right? It from the time it enters the U.S. port or from the time of the ship arrives to the time it's offloaded, ready to go, is two to three. It's probably about two weeks, and that's and so you need to build that delay into your supply chain strategy. And I think that's the biggest issue you're seeing today with a lot of supply chain leaders is they're expecting it to be the same as it was 24 months ago, and quite frankly, it's not. And a lot of them are unwilling to build those delays into their projections. Mm -hmm. I see. So it's really this, this side of forecasting what they're going to need, the preparation for that to do that, and then adjust those lead times that would just kind of pull everything together. And you're not saying adjusting lead times by six months, you're saying adjusting lead times by an extra week or two. Yeah, I mean, because if you think about it, if if I when I buy product out of you know let's say India, it still takes the same amount of time for them to make it in India. It takes the same amount of time for them to put it on a boat. It takes the same amount of time for that boat to get to the U.S. that it used to. Right? All of those transit times are are pretty much the same at this current point. It's moving through the U.S. ports that has slowed down. Where it used to take two days to clear is now two weeks. Mm. But once it gets through once port, once it gets through port, it's good to go. You know, and that's and that's you know, and that's why, in, at least in healthcare, having a reseller like Caresfield, I don't know what other resellers do this, but at least with Caresfield, I have warehouses full of product, and so if somebody calls, it's it's ready to go because I already have it landed in the U.S. I'm not pre-selling off of a container because I'm ordering those containers far enough in advance to know I will have the product here in the U.S. So you're basically already adjusted your lead times and forecast it appropriately so that you're you're actually incurring by kind of near shoring where the warehousing is you're essentially adjusted that for your customer your customer doesn't have to adjust the 2 weeks because you've already made that change on your side so that your war- warehouses are ready to go now what about air freight like has that been impacted where if somebody calls you and says yeah i need this tomorrow morning because maybe they didn't forecast or they just got blindsided by something. I got a call from a clinician, you know, who went and looked at par levels in a room and was like, Hey, uh, you know, we're out. I can't do this tomorrow. I didn't realize we were out. And then they look and, you know, they're like trying to get a delivery overnight. Is that impacted right now? Yeah, it is a little bit. So, you know, it goes back to the FedEx example, right? FedEx, if you overnight with FedEx, UPS is the same way, right? It used They used to have guaranteed 10 a.m. delivery next day. That's, you're not getting that anymore. You're getting guaranteed next day, not guaranteed 10 a.m. So it's slowed down a little bit, but it's not, it's still, I mean, it's still next day, right? It just, instead of by 10 a.m., it's by 5 p.m. All right, Wade, let me ask you this. If I'm a, you know, we've got listeners out right now that are listening that are, you know, He's a supply chain guy at Topeka, Kansas. What does he need to know? What what questions should he or she ask their manufacturer, their suppliers about lead times and those things? Anything that pops into your head? The biggest thing I would say is just how are they planning, right? Because this all comes back down to planning, right? And and I think it's, you know, the guy who's in Kansas, right? He needs to be he needs to be very honest with whoever his supplier is that, hey, I'm going to be ordering 42 cases of this product every month, or I'm going to be ordering six cases of this every five months, right? And if you're telling your retailer or your resellers or your suppliers, or your manufacturers, they can plan for that and they can set up for that. It's when someone calls up and says, hey, I need 700 cases of this in a week that causes <laughs> a little bit of issues, right? And so that's the big thing with supply chain right now is you just got to plan a little better than we ever used to plan. Makes sense. So what are some best practices for that planning? Or like, let's say you're talking to a customer who's working in the hospital and you're kind of explaining this to them, at least as it, you know, it, it may be a little bit different for every company when they're talking to suppliers, but like w- when you're having that conversation and you're 
trying to advise them on the kinds of planning is is it seriously just as simple as increasing lead times or is there something that they kind of have to do in terms of how they manage their inventory to sort of be a little more aware of how to do those projections cuz i mean in that forecasting cuz i'm just thinking of some of these really large healthcare systems right and they have all these different sites and they have inventory in all these different places you know, and sometimes they are relying on clinicians to report back on inventory where I feel like sometimes that's where they get blindsided by, you know, just like I'm a nurse. I can tell you, you know, taking inventory is not going to be my specialty, right? And yet we re- we rely on clinicians to do that in some cases. You know, it's one of the reasons I advocate for supply chain to be working directly in the operating room is to help control that with a supply chain perspective. But but, you know, what kinds of best practices should they be keeping in mind to be able to plan properly like you're suggesting? History is typically the best forecaster for the future with supply chain, right? If you used 27 specimen cups last month and you typically use 27 specimen cups every single month, you're probably going to need 27 spe- specimen cups next month, Right. And so if you take your annual usage, and this is what I do for any of the new customers, whether they're large or small, I just say, all right, what's your annual usage? So you used a thousand of this product last year. So, or let's use 12, you know, let's use 12,000 because that makes the numbers easy, right? So you use 12,000 of product X last year. So you're going to, your average is a thousand a month, right? There is going to be some cyclicality between that. Right. So you you may have a max one month of eleven hundred and a min of nine hundred. Right. But you're always going to be between nine hundred and eleven hundred a month. And so that's what you have to order and you have to stick to stick to those numbers. Right. And so it's it's relatively straightforward in the sense that you just take. I know it's math and I know everybody hates math, but. You know, if you t- if you just take your average usage right over the course of that year, you divide it by twelve, you'll be really close. Yeah, I'm glad you made the math easy because if 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 our other guy was here today, that would have been very difficult for him to do that math that you just laid out. <laughs> oh, 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 I wonder if Gary will listen to this episode. It's really funny too. This we're only two weeks removed from our little round table, get to know us and what it's like behind the scenes episode. And uh, here you are only just embodying what we let everybody in on a, a little secret about how much of a hard time we give each other. So wait, what we'll find out is if Gary listens to this later on, which is precisely the reason Hayes did it. You guys will have this to let me know test. how that turns out. This is only a test. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's great. That, I mean, so, well, I was just going to say, so I'm just going to tie this right down to just in time, yeah. right? And then, Hayes, you can, you you obviously have some stuff to offer here too, but all we've heard is just in time is impossible. You're saying with proper preparation and forecasting, which can be as simple as look at how much you've been purchasing, at least for, at least for common items, right? Like maybe some of these one-off low inventory, it's not going to work, but for your bulk you should be able to look at your consumption rates and be able to make this adjustment fairly simply. So does that mean, in your opinion, that for large consumption, large quantity volume items that just-in-time is still possible? Or are you even going to tell oh, me it's, it's yes. still possible regardless? It's it's 100% possible. I do it all the time. It's it's the way we operate here. It's it's the way we used to operate at Kraft Heinz. Like it's, it is not dead despite what everybody says. It's just you need to alter the way we look at it. You know, here in the U.S., everybody's kind of we kind of take things to the extreme all the time. And we took just in time to the absolute raggedy edge of what it was meant to do. And so when I was at Kraft and we started and we started COVID, it was, you know, for a plant that was operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, never shut down except once a year for maintenance we would have six hours of product in the facility. That's it. So we would have to get four shipments a day from all of our different vendors, right? And that's not possible anymore, you know, because if you're looking at that turn rate, you're at 1,400 turns a year, which is insane for an inventory turn rate, right? 
10 years ago, four turns a year was a good was a good number. And for those of you who don't know, turn, a turn is how many times you turn over your inventory. So if you have four turns a year, every three months, your inventory is completely refreshed. And so if you kind of go back to the basics, like right now, I'm looking, I'm doing it with boxes, right? So the, the boxes that I'm buying, every week on Monday, I get a shipment of boxes. So I only buy the boxes I need to use for the next week, and that's it. And then every Monday, they ship me another set of boxes. And so you got to adjust your, you adjust your just in time to be a little more, to have a little longer lead time than what you used to. And it's, I don't know if you can tell or not, but I love just in time. I'm a huge, huge proponent <laughs> of just in time and it works really well, you know, and it's, it's been around for over a hundred years, you know, at least over in Asia and it's, it's weathered everything and it, 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 it just, it works. But does it make sense? I was obviously waiting what you're talking about in the food business, obviously, because we have, you have really set time limits on food, right? But meanwhile, on drapes and gowns and things that a hospital might use, why do, why do you need just in time on some of that stuff? Is it as, it's not as critical, is it? Well, most warehouse, most, excuse me, most uh, hospitals don't have warehouses, right? They don't have warehouses that are capable of holding all of their, you know, three months of every single item that they could possibly use in the entire in the whole hospital. So you have to set a replenishment rate for those for those items, right? And it comes back to working capital as well. You don't want to have millions and millions and millions of dollars tied up in inventory that you're not going to use for another four months because you could be doing other things with those funds. Right. And so course. that's, I mean, and that's really the big benefit for the hospitals is that, I can hold less product. I can hold less material in my facility because my storerooms aren't as big or, or I need to use the working capital for these other projects that are going on. And we all know how cash strapped hospitals are these days. So, and that's really where the advantage comes in is if you can do it, I'm, I'm doing it with a lot of my customers. A lot of my customers call me and they say, all right, here's a PO for 700. I expect you to ship it to my door within three days of me giving you an order. So I gave you a PO for 700. I'm going to use them over the next year and I'm just going to call you whenever I need more, or I'm going to set up a schedule where you ship it, you know, every 90 days, you're going to ship me this amount and I, I ship it and send it to them. And then they never have, they never have issues. Good. So yeah. when we talked about this and I know we're getting close to the end of the interview, you know, you kind of said that just in time had a certain purpose, but we, and, and you just described it as really taking it to the very edge, but it was sort of like just in time was this purpose. But the part I remember you distinctly saying was that we wound up utilizing it simply for speed and not its intended purpose. So can you kind of like dial everybody back on just in time and say, this is what it was meant to do. And yeah, we, we started using it for speed and that's why we got caught in trouble when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden the lag times were extended significantly and the demand far was outpacing supply, like with things like gloves. Yeah. So just in time is all about reducing your waste, improving your efficiency and just smoothing out all of your production you know, at least from manufacturing, but smoothing out all of your production, right? And so if everything's running smooth, you're reducing your waste, you're reducing capital that's required, all of those things, right? But the component of just in time that is not there and has never been there has been how fast you can do something. In the United States, everybody says, well, I need just in time so I can go faster and I can save money. Save money, yes, because of you're improving your quality, you're doing all the rest of these things, but you're not saving money because you're going faster. And I can't tell you how many times I hear people talk about just in time and they go, it makes me go faster. It makes me increase my speed. It, it helps me do that. And it's like, that is not the point. The biggest point is just to smooth everything out. It really smooths out manufacturing. It smooths out your supply chain because everything is planned in advance and ready to go. And that's so just really, in time was used and abused. Yes. Oh yes. In the United States, Oh my gosh, yes, in the United States. And in Europe too. U US and Europe really, really kind of did that. Other parts of the world, not as much, especially in Japan. Like Japan is very, everything in Japan is, at least manufacturing wise, is very just in time. And that's, you know, it's the Toyota culture though for the entire country. But 
here in the United States, yeah, it, everything is about speed. And so we abused it way too much and we got way too lean on what we were trying to do with our inventories. And that then when COVID hit, that's what caused all the issues is we simply didn't have the warehouse capacity and the warehouse product that we should have had to, to weather that storm because we leaned out too much for speed. So speed. speed, you and I talked about best practices <laughs> and you said, let go of the speed yes. and, and start doing proper planning. And one of the key things that I remember you talking about was accounting for the inventory that's in transit. Now I know we just did this math and we talked about high level, man. Um, <laughs> high level. <laughs> that's some serious calculus. Um, <laughs> were you basically describing how you would account for inventory and in transit or is that a different, is that a different sort of thing to be keeping in mind with this? Yeah. So that's a little different. So, your consumption rate is how many you use a month. And then you have, there's two kind of things. There's what's called safety stock and what's called, and your reorder point. Your reorder point is more important in my opinion, just because that tells you exactly when you need to reorder. And reorder point is simply consumption times the amount of time that it takes to get there in days, right? So if you on average use a thousand a month, so there's 30 days in a month. So you, you say, let's say I need 300, what is that, 30 a month? I don't know. Whatever that math works out to be. My math brain is apparently not working. Let's say it's 10, you use 10 a day, right? If, you use, if I use 10 a day and it takes 47 days for me to get there, well, when I have 470 left on the shelf, that's when I need to reorder, right? And then you build yourself a little buffer in there. So at 520, I reorder. So I have a five-day buffer. That sounds pretty simple. It, it is when you get back to the basics. Yeah, when you put it that way. Yeah, there's almost like the impact was also the adjustment, but the but the adjustment was so painful. People said you just can't do it anymore. Instead of bringing it to its intended purpose and fun and the way it should function and how that process should flow. That's what I'm getting from listening to you. Last question, and it'll really just be on the best practices piece. But is there anything else you would add on you know good? practices, ways to, to sort of transition back to just in time if you're on the healthcare side and you're, you're, you still want to be a believer, but, you know, you've, you found yourself kind of, you know, in this situation where, you know, the way you were using it doesn't make sense to you anymore. Okay. So from the healthcare side of the business, it's very much going back to basics and you have to except that there are going to be some hiccups as you kind of get back into it, right? Because it's nothing, no transition ever flows smoothly as much as we all want it to. But if you go back to your formulas, you go back to some of the basics of supply and demand and the basics of ordering, you, sh you it, it'll come. It's just, there'll be some difficulties up front and there'll be some unfortunately, some cash up front that's required to spend in order to do that because you have to re refill your pipeline. Now, from the manufacturer side of it, it's, it's very similar, but it's a little different. So because we're importing from abroad, we have to extend the lead times even beyond what the math tells you to do because you have to add for additional time in transit for ports. And so don't try to run as lean as you thought, right? Instead of trying to, you know, have exactly seven months of inventory on hand and then every seven months, you know, you order it, try to increase that a little bit beyond where you think it should be because there are going to be some more hiccups coming for the manufacturers. Um, China, with the Shanghai port being closed earlier this year, just reopening, there's going to be some more hiccups for us on the manufacturing and distribution side that are coming. They're going to be hitting LA port here, unfortunately, sooner rather than later. So extend your lead time some more near shore as much as you possibly can, because if you're manufacturing in the United States, Canada, or Mexico, actually importing into the U.S. is very quick, so you can have less in the pipeline. So nearshoring, onshoring for us is, is a really big deal because it, it eliminates a lot of those issues, but it is coming from China again. So 
extend them out. All right, Wade. Good advice. Yeah, great job. This is some hopeful news. And, you know, I know it's coming from your perspective on the manufacturer side, but, you know, the concepts and the processes are the same, whether you're on healthcare or supply chain. And I also think that, you know, it's the transparency and the working together. So I can see where you're saying the hiccups. If your supplier partner hasn't made the adjustment, then they may not be positioned well for for you to have a successful transition yourself. Is that just to kind of summarize? Is that a is that an okay and fair statement to to suppliers out there? Yeah, I think that's very fair. And I you know and and I think it goes on to the suppliers. They need to have the onus to to stabilize the supply chain for the healthcare system. It, it's it's on us as resellers and suppliers to do that, and we need to come to terms with that. Great. Wade, great job. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I don't know if I'm your best guest, but I enjoy talking about this stuff. <laughs> I don't know. This is one of the most fun episodes we've had, Wade. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to put you I almost, there. I almost dropped a bomb on our guy who's not here again. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 you did a great job, Wade. I'm glad you're here. And this will be one uh, that I can actually share with my wife, who didn't really care about the supply chain podcast, <laughs> but she will like it. But about best used by dates, that's something that she can use right there. So that was great. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, of course. That was Wade Blum, Director of Operations and Supply Chain at Caresfield, giving us some reasons for optimism and telling us that just-in-time is still possible and offering up some best practices. And honestly, Hayes, at the very end, Wade said, you know, that really the onus goes back on the suppliers to help healthcare. And, you know, we emphasized that as we were kind of wrapping up the interview on the, on the side, no longer recording, you know, but I said to Wade, and I feel like that's really going to resonate. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that know that the talent in healthcare supply chain often gets pulled out to consulting agencies or goes to the supplier side or or even a GPO. And so, you know, a lot of the talent is flowing out of healthcare when they become seasoned. And so, you know, they do need the suppliers to help them or take the lead and, and really solve this problem. And I think, you know, the suppliers out there, many of them are already totally on top of this and doing a great job. And, and they're going to agree with Wade. And then you have the people on the healthcare side that I think, yeah, absolutely. Please help us because we need it. And so I thought just a fantastic interview with Wade. And, and I'm glad we had some fun. We were laughing and, you know, <laughs> like kind of the doomsday stuff that's been going on in supply chain with good reason, at least we're talking about some potential solutions, adjustments, and best practices to navigate our way out. Absolutely. He actually gave us, yeah, quite a few things to, you know, to look forward to and kind of get excited about. Obviously, as related to shipping times and some of those things, that was great. But to your point earlier, just th that, yes, the, the burden is on the supplier and the manufacturer to get the stuff here because a hospital needs it. And they cannot force the manufacturer to do it. They just they just need the product uh, when they need it and how they need it. So he had some great things to say. I, I, he was a great guest. Yeah, love him. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Power Supply. As a reminder, you can support us by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts. We're also available on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or just search for Power Supply on your favorite podcast application. We've also got bonus content for certain episodes, but to access it, you'll have to have our smartphone app for either iPhone or Android. And hey, while you're in the App Store or in the Marketplace, you can just go ahead and give us a rating and a review because your feedback is important to us here. On behalf of Hayes and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Power Supply.